Jane, glad to have you on the show today. And I'm happy to be on the show. I'm happy to be awesome. here. Awesome. So COVID-19, the world, and um, data, connection, connectivity, what's your take? Well, I say COVID-19, like we call it, is a pandemic, isn't it? Is that in, in, it's induced its own health crisis, economic challenges. But in terms of data and the digital world and telecoms, it does have some pluses. Because I think one of the largest ways we have coped globally is using the digital. We have used the digital to cope. The fact that we could do online learning, the fact that even sometimes we could do e-health for cases where people couldn't go physically to the hospital, the fact that some companies and businesses and offices could pivot and go online to do their work or do webinars, I think that has been a coping mechanism. So if you look at it on a global trend, one of the ways we have coped for COVID-19 is using the digital or using the internet. If we, if we look at Nigeria today, um, would you say that we are on the right track with connectivity? We still have a huge gap. Nigeria still, because even though we have a mobile penetration, I think about 50%, our internet usage is still very low. And that's what you're looking at. The reasons beyond the main cities people could not cope is because we didn't have access to the internet. So we have two issues, two big issues that we are really battling with. One is the fact that we don't have a lot of people connected, so we don't have a lot of connected users. And if you don't have connected users, that's a problem. Then you don't have a lot of people on the internet. So it was very difficult for a lot of, um, just look at the educational system. How many? 80% of the schools are outside the cities and they couldn't be online. So we've shut down the schools for almost the whole year. Apart from the private schools that probably have some infrastructure, the government-owned schools, the public schools could not uh, pivot. They don't have any online infrastructure. So that sector was hugely affected. Retail, entertainment, hugely affected. I would say is some of the um, SMEs that were online that could probably cope and some of the multinationals are already online, but a huge segment of our society could not cope. And one of the things I was really proud of was like, I think after the lockdown, like two or three months after, we saw a lot of states responding in terms of connectivity. They started reducing the right of way. Some of them stuck to the government rate of 145 Naira. Others reduced it lower. Others actually gave it for free. But that has been in our plan for years and nobody did it. So COVID has actually forced us to act faster. It's like pushing us, pushing us out to really address our digital or connectivity issue faster. That's one of the ways I would like to say that the fact that it's forcing us to do what we need to do. So Jane, apart from the issues like right of way that you mentioned that you know, some, some state governments um, sort of um, fast track, what are some of the other thoughts or advice that you would have for, for the government? So right away was, it's key because of infrastructure, because definitely, like I said, the, the, big, the biggest thing is you have to create infrastructure. You have to create broadband infrastructure and fiber was very key. And, you know, companies wouldn't want to go to areas where there's no, if the cost is too high, they wouldn't go. So that was one good way that, you know, we've addressed it. I think the second thing we need to do, we need to use policy as well. Uh, we need support because one of the biggest gap, if you, if you read the, Affordable Internet for All report for 2020 that just came out. One of the biggest gaps for Nigeria is devices. We don't have affordable devices. A huge part of the population does not have affordable devices or doesn't have access to it. We can look for ways to address that. You know, the duties, the clearance fees that uh, companies that import these devices have to pay for could have been a barrier. And another thing is to also use our investor service fund to also address that gap. Because if we make devices available, we would have more penetration. So we are solving two things. So we, we create the connectivity. We also make sure that the population is uh, um, enabled. Okay, you, you mentioned the digital divide. Um, any hope for the rural areas from the way things stand? Well, the, the hope is difficult right now. <laughs> I like to be optimistic. I'm very optimistic. I wouldn't want to say like there's no hope, you know. Uh, there's a huge gap, even though Africa as a continent, you know, Africa as a continent, 70, even though we have about, uh, I think about 34% of the population, you, you know, with access to um, 
mobile devices, only 16% of a 1.3 million population, 16 have access to the internet. So the digital divide is huge. We compare us to other regions. Uh, but the digital divide is not something you can address in one day. You know, COVID has just brought it to our attention at the forefront and made it a very urgent issue. But I don't think we can address it in one day because even though we want to address connectivity, it's infrastructure, it's CapEx investment. You know, we're already having logistical challenges. We can't seem to bring, you know, the right goods uh, and import them into the country. So to import the infrastructure or, you know, or deliver infrastructure with lockdowns and challenges like this is going to be very difficult. So the digital divide is not going to just go away a couple of months. It's, you don't, there's no short-term uh, solution to the problem. It's a lot of investment. It's going to take time because you have to go to the rural areas, underserved areas. And it's not going to be a, a social impact kind of work. You know, most times social impact is long. And most times uh, for things to be really sustainable, I think you need a private sector. It always has to be a commercial bearing. It makes it more sustainable. When people have a commercial reason to do something, it's more sustainable because it can be maintained. And most times when it's just social impact, you know, like all this project, we go there, we install the nodes and we disappear. Nobody maintains them. Nobody takes care of them. So it works for the first couple of months. And after that, the thing is no longer working because it's not sustainable. So th that in terms of the models we use, it has to change. I think you're probably a private public partnership will work because the private sector would always come with a commercial or business uh, driven incentive to make sure that it's sustainable. You just don't do it and walk away. So it's not going to be a short term solution. I'm sorry about that, but I'm, I'm an optimist to say that let's put it now as an urgent issue to address. Yeah. So, so yeah. So how, how do you think the private sector can make uh, economic sense of the rural areas that may not have the, purchasing power that those in the urban areas have? It's got to do with the way business is being done today with the private sector. We are looking for high returns. And when you're looking for high returns, uh, the rural areas do not give you an attractive model. So I think, first of all, we have to change the models. Um, there has to be a lot of collaborative effort between the public sector and the private sector. So when I mean change the models, uh, the traditional model is that you want to look at your total cost of ownership from a certain angle. You know, you put your cost and you must get your revenues that will cover your cost and give you the lovely EBITDA margins you think of. But uh, maybe we have to change it in a way that are there ways we could address that cost with a partnership. And some of those costs is like what we're saying, if the cost is too high, the right of way, the clearing fees for bringing equipment into the country, the licenses and permits you have to pay to put a site up, you know, site acquisition. Is there a way we can collaborate with the government, with the public sector to reduce those fees so that for the rural areas, it makes it easier for the private sector to go in? Finally, what do you expect from the industry post COVID-19? Post COVID-19, so this is a wake up call. It's like, <laughs> it's been a wake up call. Nigeria, wake up, you're far behind. Because I, I was looking at some stats, it says that we have 1% of our, re, of our digital um, economy using digital services, 1%. So we can, there's a whole 99% that is just wasting away. So what I would love to see post COVID is a situation where my auntie in the village will be able to receive mobile money from me. And she could use that mobile money to trade to pay her children's school fees, where my grandmother in the village can receive e-health services because there's connectivity available in that village. You know, those are just trying to paint a picture of all the possibilities for Nigeria because that is definitely creating the digital economy. And we cannot do that if we don't start now investing. We can talk about these nice, fancy ideas, but the only way is to start now. So today is our morning. Can we start now? Can we start investing in the infrastructure? Jane, always a pleasure chatting with you. And thank you for being on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure to be on this show.